Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. On a cold winter's night in February of 1920 in Berlin, Germany, a woman was apprehended by the police for attempting to jump off a bridge. The woman had no paperwork on her and she refused to give an identity. She was taken to Elizabeth Hospital, where for two years, she was known as Miss Unknown. During this time, she was held in a mental institution. In 1922, another patient at the asylum named Claire Puthart decided that this Miss Unknown was none other than the Grand Duchess Tatiana Romanoff, the second daughter of the late Tsar Nicholas II. Once Claire was released from the asylum, she told officials of her discovery. The identity of this patient would go on to rack the minds of conspirators all over the world. It would leave people wondering what really happened to the last of the Romanoffs. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a very very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on esoteric atlanta if you would like to join our patron and our producer community there's a link down in the description box below welcome to esoteric atlanta my name is bryce and today we are finally getting to the grand finale of our research into the romanoff family and the ultimate mystery of whether or not Anastasia Romanov or any of the Romanovs survived the doom of the Bolsheviks. Now, just a little note for this video before we get into the deep dive. My camera is not working that well today, so this episode is going to be podcast only. I will make sure the visuals, though, are pictures of the particular people or events that we're referring to as we go down this story. I apologize for any inconveniences. Hopefully, my camera will be working soon. There's a quote that I saw in the comment section a while back, and I thought that this was a pretty good summary of the conspiracy around Anastasia Romanoff. This commenter wrote, sometimes it is much better to assume that you are a somebody than accept that you are a nobody. If you missed last week's episode, we definitely did a deep dive into all of the things that led up to the night in July of 1918 when the Romanov family was unalived by the Bolsheviks. In the last episode, I explained that this conspiracy of survivors of the Romanov actually makes sense given what we know about the early 20th century and the communist USSR. Pretty much around this time is when the, uh, the Iron Curtain fell over the Soviet Union. And because so little information was given to the outside world from the Soviet Union, it was very easy to assume that some of these members could have again survived. As I said last week, it is apparent that most people assumed, rightly so, that the Tsar Nicholas II was probably not alive. After all, he was the Tsar. But most people were very confused as to what would have happened to his wife or his children. After all, his children 
were simply that. They were innocent children. We do know that a lot of the Romanovs, including some of Nicholas's siblings, did, uh, lucky for them, they, they did get to escape Russia before there was warrant death warrants released for them. And we're going to talk about one of Nicholas's sister, the Grand Duchess Olga. He, he also had a daughter named Olga, but one of his sisters named Olga was um, huge in in some of these imposter cases that we are going to be looking at, one one in particular, which is probably the most famous Anastasia conspiracy, which is the woman who was known as Anna Anderson. But what I did not know when I was really looking into the conspiracy around Anastasia Romanoff is that there were many, 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 many imposters, not just a couple. And actually, Anastasia's imposters, she she had the least of one of the least amount compared to some of her siblings. Her brother Alexei had way more imposters than she did. But but these imposters were able to to strike up stories and storylines and and try to claim some Romanoff fame again because the iron Iron Curtain was so heavy that that nobody really knew. Nobody really knew what had happened. And of course, for the majority of the 20th century, there was no such thing as DNA testing. And so for these people who were researching what happened to the Romanovs and who were investigating these claims of survivors, they were heavily relying on resemblances to photographs. They would look at eye color, ears. They would also study mannerisms of these people, uh, whether they could speak Russian or not. And some of the more um, concerning traits of these people were oftentimes ignored because of trauma. For example, Anna Anderson, the one that we're really going to talk about, she herself had scars all over her head and her body, which could have been um, explained away by what happened to her the Romanovs on the night in July in 1918. We also know, as we covered last week, that the guards of the Apativ house, the house of special purposes, where the Romanovs met their fate, most of these guards, in fact, all of these guards, were not trained marksmen. And I know now, in further research, that the guards that actually did the deed were all drunk. They had to be drunk in order to do what they were ordered to do. We also know from last week that they were trying to, no pun intended, but they were trying to execute these orders sooner because uh, than they than they did in July of 1918, but they couldn't. Many of the guards that they hired when they found out what they had to do to these children, they quit. They they they, they couldn't go through with it. Which does give me some some silver lining in this story and the fact that the guards that finally did agree to do the deed had to be drunk to do it shows you that even in, in this brainwashing and in this extreme political radical belief there maybe was a glimmer of humanity, you know, that that whole I had to be drunk in order to actually fulfill the, the task at hand. I'm, I'm trying to watch my words. I hope you guys understand because of, of YouTube. But because they were not trained marksmen, there was a lot of chaos. And we only know what specifically happened that night now since the USSR has crumbled. Now we're able to look back at old records and journals from, from the guards and, and kind of get the same story from everyone of what actually happened that night. And we do know, and this is common sense too, that if these are not trained marksmen, then they're probably they're probably gonna mess up. It's not gonna be a quick and easy over in a minute task, right? Again, I'm trying to, to watch my words. We know that the girls themselves, the daughters, the grand duchesses had sewn a lot of the family jewels into their corsets and their bras. And because they felt like at some point, if they were to be released, they would be able to sell these jewels for money to restart their life. Again, their father had already abdicated the throne. So they technically were not monarchs anymore. But they kept their jewelry, again, in the hopes that they would be able to use these jewels to restart their life. And they sewed them into their clothes so that the guards at the Apatib house would not know that they had these jewels. And because these jewels were, again, sewn into their bodices, into their corsets, they kind of acted a bit like a protective vest. And so that's another reason why it took a long time to get this, this, um, this task done. 
And um, so we know it was very mus messy. We know that there was a lot of smoke in the room. They were in the basement. And so because of this, we can see how a conspiracy would grow. That one of the daughters or the son perhaps would have survived. Now, I'm going to, at the end of this video, I'm going to give my opinion on this. And um, if you care to hear my opinion, that will be at the end. But let's go back and talk about the biggest imposter from the Romanov family. Now, the reason why Anastasia Romanov's conspiracy grew bigger than her siblings or her parents for all the imposters that stepped in across the years to claim to be the missing Ro Romanovs is because of this really big story with Anna Anderson and with the with Hollywood, with all the movies. I mean, I think most of us from our my generation and younger or slightly younger, remember that Disney did a whole movie called Anastasia about this, this story. So that's the reason why I think so many people consider this to be the Anastasia conspiracy, that she survived, this 17-year-old girl survived a brutal attack. When again, in reality, at least every single member of that family, besides Alexandra, the wife, she's the only person that I could not find any imposters. So before we look deeper at Anna Anderson and her story, I just want to give you some numbers here because, again, this was something that was really fascinating. Now, Anastasia had 34 imposters. So from 1918 until for, for almost 100 years, right, there were 34 people who claimed to be the late Grand Duchess Anastasia Romanoff. There were 53 people who claimed to be the late Grand Duchess Maria Romanoff, one of the daughters. 33 people claim to be the late Grand Duchess Tatiana Romanoff. 28 people claim to be the late Grand Duchess Olga Romanoff, the oldest child of Nicholas II and Alexandra. And 81, 81 people claim to be the late Alexei Romanoff, the future czar. Nicholas II's only son, 81 people, Alexei, the little boy who had hemophilia, 81 people claimed to be him after the night of July 1918. And then we had one person claim to be Nicholas II. So again, for those who were not aware, because I wasn't aware until I started doing this research, I thought before I started doing this research that the only person who had claims of surviving was Anastasia, but that is not true. Again, so many imposters, so many, too many for us to go through all of them. But I just wanted to give you that little tidbit of information that there were there were roughly two hundred thirty people in total who claimed to be Romanovs. So again, Anna Anderson, as as she would go on to be known, was apprehended in February of 1920, and she was about to jump off of a bridge in the attempts to unalive herself. The police apprehended her and brought her to a mental institution in Germany. Again, she refused to talk, and she had no paperwork to give her any identity, so they did call her Miss Unknown for about two years of her stay in this men mental institution. They also say that while she spent her two years in this hospital, she was unresponsive to questions. She was prone to deep depression. She also would have fits of rage. She was extremely malnourished when they brought her into the hospital and she did have scars all over her head and her body. She spoke German with a strange accent that was thought at the time to be Russian. She did understand Russian, but could not speak it. She was prone to delusions and fantasies, and she did react strangely to a photo that was placed of the late Romanovs in a magazine. 
It was obvious to many of the hospital staff that she had a very thorough education. And she would speak about other royalty in Europe as if she knew them, which would make sense because we know that the monarchy all over um, Europe, Russia, they're all intermarried. They all know each other, right? So she would speak of these people as if they were old friends. Now, again, her her hospital mate, I guess you could say another patient that was also in the hospital with her, this woman named Claire. Now, Claire herself was a seamstress, but she was she had this mental disorder where she thought she was being persecuted at all times. I don't really know what the technical term for that is now. I mean, this is like 100 years ago, so I don't know if 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 there is a, a more correct way to talk about mental illness. So I'm just kind of describing to you guys what the atmosphere was like with these people who I believe definitely had personality disorders. So this Claire woman, she was she was really um, paranoid about everything. She thought everyone was out to get her. And so she had been institutionalized with this Miss Unknown, this person who nobody knew who she was. And because Claire had been a seamstress, she claimed she was originally from Poland, which was a part of Russia, was kind of annexed as part of Russia with the... Um, with the czars, with the Romanovs, and she claimed that she had been a seamstress for the Romanovs. And she thought that this patient, this Miss Unknown, was again Tatiana Romanov, um, the second oldest daughter of the czars. When Claire was released from the asylum, she again went and told many officials of her of her findings that she truly believed that this was to be Tatiana Romanov, the Grand Duchess Tatiana, and obviously her behavior, this this kind of crazy delusional behavior and these scars in her impulses, her fits of rage were probably just side effects of PTSD of what she had gone through. You know, people can excuse that, right? Like, oh, she's badly behaved because of look what she survived. So she went and got the officials to come look at this woman. And this is what instigated this little miss unknown woman to, to live out the fantasy of being a Romanov. When it was determined that she was not tall enough to be Tatiana, she then claimed that she was actually Anastasia. Her story would often change, though. She claimed that on that fateful night of July 17th, 1918, that when the ordeal started, we'll say, because again, I'm watching my words, when the, the men started to you know, when the death warrant was was released, that she hid behind her sister Tatiana, and then she fainted. She said she regained consciousness, and she was in the house of a soldier who had saved her. Now, she claimed that she moved to Romania with the soldier. In her first story, she said that when the soldier's wife had died, she snuck into Germany. Then she went back and changed the story. She said that in 1920, she had had a child with the soldier, this, sol this magical story of the soldier who had saved her. And when the soldier was actually unalived, she left the son behind in Romania and crossed into Germany and she needed them to help her find the son. She even gave names of these soldiers and unfortunately, all the soldiers and the guards that were present that night at the Apatib house, they were all identified. None of them had moved to Romania and none of them were under this name that she had given. So at first people questioned her thinking that maybe this was a German government conspiracy, that maybe this woman had been tricked to pretend like she was a Romanov for a political poll and this was around the time in this 1922, 1923 era where we start seeing people speculate that this could actually be like a mind controlled, if you guys know what I'm saying, like a person who was who was pulled in by the government and mind controlled and tricked into believing they were a missing Romanov in order to create political pull in, in Germany. Um, Anyway, so that was the first time we start hearing this conspiracy, but thus continued this look into her. And there were some things that she knew, like there were some things she knew about the Romanovs that, that you wouldn't have known unless you were privy to their interpersonal lives. They looked at her ears and the ears of Anastasia Romanov, and they definitely were very similar. We know ears don't really change, but the problem was her eyes. 
You see, Anna Anderson, or this little miss unknown person that was claiming to be the la the lost Grand Duchess Anastasia, the fourth daughter of Tsar Nicholas II and his wife Alexandra, Anastasia had gray eyes. Anna Anderson, Miss Unknown, the person claiming to be Anastasia, had piercing blue eyes. However, my friends, this is the 1920s. The only photography that is available is black and white photography. So most people were not super familiar with the distinct coloring of people's eyes. And we do know that Nicholas II, her father, was known to be very good looking. And, and it was rumored from the, the peasants, the, the, the little people of the world, that he had these piercing blue eyes. And so Anna Anderson also having piercing blue eyes gave people this confirmation bias that she must be the lost daughter of Nicholas II, not realizing again that the actual Anastasia Romanov had gray eyes. Around this time, many family members who had survived the Bolsheviks were called in to meet the young lady. The maternal grandmother from Germany was called in and she said that this was not her granddaughter, as well as Grand Duchess Olga, the aunt of, of Anastasia, Nicholas II's sister. We know some of Nicholas II's siblings were also unalived by the Bolsheviks, but again, Grand Duchess Olga Romanov, uh, Nicholas II's sister, again, not to be confused with his daughter, who was also named, one of his daughters was also named Olga. I've watched many, before this, I've watched many documentaries on her, and her life was absolutely fascinating. And she literally got out of Russia by the skin of her teeth. And she ended up immigrating to Toronto, Canada, where she basically lived a pretty um, normal life. A very well adapted long life. I know she's got children herself that still live over there that are obviously some of the, the, the remaining descendants of the Romanovs that are just private citizens at this time. But she was flown over to Germany to meet this woman and she herself she explains it as being very excited at the possibility that one of her nieces survived this horrific uh, event. And the possibility that, that she could have a relationship with her niece, get her niece into safety. But when she met this woman, she knew right away that this was not, this was not her niece. And I just, I, I think as an aunt myself, I don't have my own children, but as an aunt myself, I would apps, I know my niece and nephews. I, I, I know what they look like. I know their facial expressions. I know how their personalities and I think even if you go through trauma, yes, trauma will say will change your personality slightly, but I do think the base of you is always still there. And so I definitely, a lot of people dismissed Olga as being, you know, too blindsided by the trauma. There was a lot of people that, you know, people who wanted confirmation bias that this was actually Anastasia, they kind of dismissed these family members' claims that this person was not who she said she was. But honestly, I mean... I just, you guys, like an aunt, an aunt knows her nephew and nieces. Like I would know if that was actually my nephew or my nieces. If something like this happened, I would absolutely 100% know if it was actually them or not. And if it was one of my nephew or nieces, 100%, I would take them home with me and I would care for them and I would help rehabilitate them. So I absolutely believe Nicholas, the second sister and the maternal grandmother that when they said this is not their 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 family member i absolutely believe them in 1928 this got so bad that the remaining romanovs issued a declaration that anderson was in fact an imposter now again as i stated a few minutes earlier there were many people many people who were running around saying that they were romanovs and so in geneva at one of the geneva banks they had actually established a database system to keep up with all these claims because once again, we have the Iron Curtain on the USSR. Nobody really knows what happened. Nobody really knows the details of what happened to the Romanovs because the USSR is not releasing that information. The people in the USSR, the Russian people and the, the neighboring countries that were annexed into the USSR do not know 
what actually happened that night. They're too busy fighting for their own survival to have any information about the fate of the Romanovs. Okay, so this is why these grand conspiracies were able to grow so quickly with people because nobody knew anything. All the outside world knew was that the 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 czar and the czardom had fallen. That's all they knew is that that the Romanovs had fallen and the Bolsheviks had taken over. And when that when the Bolsheviks took over, the Iron Curtain fell. That's all anybody knew. And again, as I said last week, I can understand why people, especially people around the world, would become fascinated with this conspiracy, right? Because it speaks of human resilience. It, it doesn't, it's not really about the fact that they were royalty or they were monarchs. It's about the fact that they were human beings that were put in a pretty impossible situation. And if one of them survived this impossible situation, then that speaks of the human spirit. And regardless of what area of the world you're from, it doesn't matter. Culture, all that kind of stuff doesn't matter. Human beings at the root of us, we're all the same. We all experience love. We all experience betrayal. We all experience heartbreak. And so I, I really, in, in my, my gut feeling, I feel like people were so fascinated for almost 100 years, so fascinated with this conspiracy because it's a reflection of humanity. It's a reflection of ourselves and us surviving in, in impossible situations. Now, of course, Today, in 2024, many people are hooked in this, into this conspiracy because they believe someone's going to come save them, which I've spoke about multiple times, which we're going to talk more about at the end of this and the conclusion of this. But going back to what I said with this, this bank establishing a database and a lot of governments becoming involved in trying to understand what happened and if there were survivors and a lot of the public trying to figure out what happened. We're in the midst of, you know, in 1922... We're in between two world wars. World War One has just finished and we're gearing up to the eve of World War Two. So there's just chaos and turmoil all over the world at this moment. And so I, I think, again, in these moments of vulnerability and fear, we look to, towards these grand conspiracies because it gives us hope. It's hopium. It makes us believe that as human beings, we can overcome great odds. But nonetheless, 1928, the remaining Romanovs did issue a declaration saying that Anderson specifically, this Miss Unknown, was an imposter. Now, another thing that is also interesting to note is that when the Romanovs were unalived, at that point, they had very little money. They were lived in the, the lap of, of opulence before the Bolsheviks. But when they abdicated the throne and they were taken under house arrest, they lost access to everything. The state, the Russian state, took everything from them. But many people believed, some of these imposters believed, that the Romanovs had stacks of wealth and money in other areas of the world. Now, whether that's true or not, the official narrative is that that is not true, that they did not have stacks of money. But I just thought that was interesting as well. So that's another perspective of why people were perhaps playing like they were these imposters is to try to get their hands on what they perceive to be wealth. And again, this was before DNA testing. So I can see, you know, tr trying to kind of see things from different angles, how a person who's desperate, like a, a con artist, a scammer, who's desperate for money or fame or feeling important, whatever, you know, whatever it is, whatever their motivation is, could take in t the time to learn whatever they needed to learn to try to play the part to get whatever payout they were looking to get. Now, at this time, too, of 1928, the, uh, the German state did officially give paperwork to Little Miss Unknown. Now, again, they had no, they had nothing. They had no idea who this person was. And so the only details that they could put in her paperwork, like a passport, were literally the details of the late Grand Duchess Anastasia Romanov. So this makes this conspiracy even trickier now because the Romanovs themse themselves had said, not ours. She doesn't belong to us. But because there is no 
trace of who this person actually is and she needs paperwork the german government just gives her paperwork with anastasia Roman romanoff's details so she literally has paperwork now saying that she is anastasia romanoff anastasia romanoff excuse me let me let me say that again she literally has paperwork saying that she is anastasia romanoff but the family is saying no so this huge court battle kind of continues through most of Anna Anderson's life uh, uh, regarding her own identity. Now, again, this goes back to this idea that potentially this was a German conspiracy. I mean, again, we're leading up into World War II. So was she a plant by the German government? I don't know. Possibly. Again, we'll talk more about that in the, in the um, conclusion aspect. But the German government did put her in a secluded house in the Black Forest of Germany, where she was given, again, the name Anastasia anderson and she lived there for quite some time just kind of by herself many people would harass her they would go and try to take pictures of her so she 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 definitely lived a very paparazzi life even though she was in seclusion by the government in 1968 she moves to the united states she marries an american in charlottesville virginia now, her husband was a man who was 20 years younger than her, and he was a history professor at the University of Virginia who loved to study royal genealogy. Now, for those who are not from the United States, the University of Virginia is a very, very, very prestigious university. The University of Virginia and the University of Georgia, where I live, are two of the most prestigious universities in the United States. So a history professor from Virginia is probably a pretty respected professor, which I find, which makes this story even more fascinating, my friends, because it just goes to show you, it doesn't matter how smart you are, mental illness can affect anyone because I personally believe, this is my own personal opinion, that her husband was also mentally ill. So he was a professor, a history professor at the University of Virginia who loved to study royal genealogy. He told everyone once he married her, and again, she was 20 years older than him. Now, this is my own hang up. I know that this is my own issue. It is hard for me to comprehend a relationship where the woman is older. I have this weird thing about, I, I know it's me, it's me. It's it's not, this is just my own like OCD thing. I've always, in my personal life, as many, I've talked about this before, I have always dated men and been in long-term relationships with men who are older than me. My current boyfriend is 11 years older than me. I had a very long relationship with a man who was 15 years older than me. I, I often think that in my mind that the man should be older than the woman. I, I don't know where that comes from, but 20 years. And I even told myself, like I was in a long rela relationship with a man 15 years older than me. And that was probably, that's probably the, the oldest I will go because at that point you are moving into a totally different generation and there were just differences, right? So be, to be 20 years older than somebody, you could be their parent, right? Like that's, it's just strange to me. And especially for a man to be 20 years younger than the female. In fact, in researching this case, I watched some footage with the two of them and it was weird. Like it looked like, especially when she was older because she aged pretty rapidly in their own home. Like it looked like he was taking care of his grandmother. That's what it looked like. And I'm not saying his name intentionally because I don't want to like traumatize his family or family members or anything like that but that information is out there if, if you want to look it up but it, it was bizarre to me bizarre and i don't think that this marriage had any basis in true love because it is stated that they never slept in the same bedroom now i do know that it is that in today's society i have a lot of friends myself who have separate bedrooms from their husbands and they claim it makes their marriage a lot better um I enjoy sleeping in the bed with my partner. I I just um yeah, and I know again in today's in today's society that that is is considered to be kind of normal, but 
I think back in the 1960s going into the 70s like to not like there was no passion between the two of them and so my assumption and this is my speculation this is not fact this is just my assumption is that she married this man because this man was obsessed with monarchy and he's so he's a history professor and he's so obsessed with these royal families that he himself wanted to believe that this woman was in fact Anastasia and she married him I believe in order to have a life because you know they were members of the country club apparently this man came from a wealthy family so she was able to have a life where she was also validated her own delusions were validated okay I mean he went around telling people that he was the son-in-law of the czar I mean what you know, like, this is just a very eccentric and wackadoo couple, in my opinion. In 1983, Anna Anderson was institutionalized again into a mental hospital in Virginia. A few days after she was admitted, her husband kidnapped her out of the institution, and they drove around Virginia for three days eating from gas stations. You know, if she really was a Romanoff by birth, oh, how the mighty have fallen, right? You go from being in these opulent palaces to now eating out of gas stations. The police finally apprehended her and brought her back to the hospital. She eventually ended up passing away on the 13th of February of 1984 of pneumonia. And again, the mystery persisted. It continued to persist. Was this person the real Anastasia or not? And what about the other imposters? By her death in 1984, the USSR was still in full swing, so nobody had the answers. But before we go any further, let's take a brief moment to hear a word from one of our sponsors, Spooky 2. Spooky 2 is a rife machine that helps you with energetic healing of all sorts of issues. If you type in Bryce Watson at checkout, you will get 5% off your purchases. And hold on for one second while we hear a testimonial about the Spooky 2 Rife Machines. Welcome to the Ricky Zen Den. I'm here with my dog, Bourbon, and he wanted to share a little bit about his story so that we can help other pet parents know that there are other holistic and alternative methods out there to helping your dog on their road to recovery and healing. So a little bit about Bourbon's story. We had him, um, he was running, let's say, and it was a, a rainy day and he went to run up the steps and he skipped a step and landed spread eagle and left out a huge yelp. Um, so thankfully, my son carried him down the steps for me, got him in the car, and we took him right to the vet. So they confirmed that he did, in fact, severely tear, um, basically completely, both of his ACLs, or what's called a CCL in the dog lingo. And they said that he needed surgery to heal and recover. However, he was only eight months old at the time, and they would not do surgery on him because his growth platelets were still open in his legs. So they sent me home with an injured dog and said, bring him back when he's a year old, and they would do the surgery. Now, the surgery, mind you, was going to cost $5,000 per leg and two months recovery in a crate while he was recovering, and the surgery had to be done one leg at a time. So that would be $10,000 and four months of him being in a crate. That doesn't sound like a good solution to me. So I encourage you to go to Spooky2 and download their software just to kind of look around and see if maybe your ailments are in the database because I bet you they are. So now let's get into it. So the first thing I did with Bourbon is I took the connectors and... I hooked him up to the TENS pads. So what I did is I took the TENS pads and I placed them on the inside of his thigh by where his knee is. So right around where the actual ACL or CCL would be located. And then I ran what we call a biofeedback scan. 
The biofeedback scan in the database, what it does is it sends electromagnetic frequencies into your electromagnetic field within your body. Anything that is not supposed to be there, it calls a hit. So it records up to 10 hits per biofeedback scan. It takes about five or six minutes and boom, you have your, your results. So then once I record and save those hits, I turn around and I switch it to contact mode, keeping the TENS pads in the exact same spot that I just ran the biofeedback scan. And then I run a 30 minute contact session for him. Now, he feels so amazing when he's getting these frequencies that if I'm in messing with the Rife Therapy machine and getting something ready maybe for myself or a client, he will actually come over and be like, hey, thinking he's going to get a session. That's how much he loves it because he knows it's making him feel better. So the infamous Anna Anderson died again in 1984 of pneumonia with, again, a big question mark over who she really was. But in 1979, in May of 1979, five years before Anna Anderson passed away, the remains of five of the Romanov bodies were found. They were found by somebody who lived in the area of the Apativ house, but nobody knew that these bodies had actually been located because the Soviet Union was still in full swing. So the person who found the bodies could not say anything, anything because of the Soviet Union. The bodies were actually kept a secret until 1991 when the five bodies that had been found were exhumed. Now, again, these were only five bodies. We had a female and a male, an adult female, an adult male, presumed to be Nicholas II and Alexandra and three daughters. So we still had two bodies that were missing, Alexei, the son, and another daughter. So from 1991 until 2007, because only five bodies had been exhumed, the conspiracy about Anastasia surviving grew even more. This was almost seen as proof that she had actually survived and maybe just maybe Anna Anderson was right or the other imposters were right. Well, on the 23rd of August, 2007, two more bodies were found. They were found very close to the location of the other five bodies. These bodies were in worse condition. They had been burned. And they knew that one of the bodies was of Alexei. And as it turned out, the other body was of Maria, the other sister, Maria. And this, this was found out in 2008 through DNA testing. So it appears that Anastasia had been with her mother and her father and her other two sisters, Tatiana and Olga, the whole time. She was one of the, the first bodies that had been exhumed. Now, they did the DNA testing using mitochondrial DNA, which is the, through the feminine line. Your mitochondrial DNA comes through your mother. And so they asked Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, to submit some of his DNA because his maternal grandmother was Tsarina Alexandra's sister. And through Prince Philip's DNA, they were able to determine that these were, in fact, the Romanovs. Now, in 1979, the same year that the bodies of the Romanovs, the five, five bodies, had been secretly found, Anna Anderson had surgery. So this was five years before she actually passed away of pneumonia, where they took some of her tissue from her intestines. And even though her body had been cremated in 1994, when she did pass away, they were able to take this uh, tissue from her intestines that had been saved for this purpose and, and test it against the uh, Prince Philip's DNA and the Romanoff's DNA, and it did not match. Shocker, right? It turns out that Anna Anderson was actually a Polish woman, just a regular old Polish woman, <laughs> just like the rest of us. No relationship to the Romanovs. Shocking, I know. Very, very shocking. <laughs> and it turns out that none of the imposters were who they said they were because we do have all five bodies from that night.
So as the Soviet Union came to a close, we were able to get more information on what had happened on that night of the 17th of July, 1918. After the... Um, after the ordeal, we'll say, happened, the bodies were loaded into a Fiat truck. The plan was to take the bodies deep into the Koptyaki forest, but the vehicle they used struggled. The weight of all the bodies was too heavy for this vehicle. Again, this wasn't, they were not prepared. These men who carried out these warrants were not prepared for the task that they were assigned to do. They were drunk. They didn't, they weren't marksmen. They didn't know what to do. Their car couldn't hold the weight of these bodies. We had the Romanov's bodies on top of four servants. So that's a lot of bodies to put in the back, uh, literally no pun intended, dead weight to put in the back of your truck. So the vehicle struggled to get to where they wanted to dump the bodies. So they had to kind of do a makeshift dump site. And thank God, right? Thank God this is how this worked out because this, I think, is how we were able to then find the bodies because they weren't hidden as well as they should have been. Now, again, these guys were not prepared. In fact, I find it hysterical. They brought one shovel, one shovel for the whole lot of them. They dropped the bodies in a clearing that's called the Four Brothers. And I actually have the coordinates for the location, which I will place up on the screen. So you can kind of, if you're into geography, you can look at that location for yourself. They stripped all the bodies of their clothes in order to take all the jewels that had been sewn into the bodies. And then they doused them with acid. So the bodies were doused without acid in order to disfigure them. So in case they were to be discovered, no one would know it was actually the Romanoffs. Again, this was long before DNA testing. So they figured that if they disfigured the bodies, that no one would know that, that, that this was the Imperial family. And then, of course, they buried them and the, the, the bodies were discovered in uh, for originally in 1979. And then the other bodies were discovered in 2007. So on the 15th of August 2000, before they found the other two bodies, the Russian Orthodox Church canonized the family. On the 1st of October 2008, the Superior Court of the Russian Federation ruled that Nicholas II's families were victim of political repression. In 2015, the bodies were re-exhumed just to do more DNA testing because they just really wanted to make sure. I mean, this conspiracy, you guys, this conspiracy literally went on for 100 years. For 100 years. 100 years. And so they buried them and they were like, you know what? Let's pull them back up. Let's just double check one more time to make sure that we actually have the right people in our possession. And of course, absolutely, this was the Romanov family. They are laid to rest at the St. Catherine Chapel at St. Petersburg, St. Peter and Paul Cathedral, which has been the resting place for the Imperial family since Peter the Great. All right, you guys. So to conclude this deep dive, I'm going to give you my opinion, which I told you I would give you my opinion at the very beginning of this project, looking into the Romanovs. And of course, last week, I told you I would save my opinion for the last video. And again, this is strictly my opinion. I don't believe that any of the Romanovs survived that night. I can understand why people would want to believe that. And I think that that believing that somebody, that a human spirit is strong enough to go through that is beautiful. And I think we should always have hope and, and understand that we are resilient and that we are stronger than we think we are. And I, I think that, it, that it, again, that's a beautiful thing. But I don't believe that is what happened. I think that in the likelihood that Anastasia or any of the other children weren't unalived by the um, the guards in that basement, if one of them had whimpered in the cart signifying they were still alive, I think that they would have been immediately unalived. If for some reason they were to escape, and this is just Occam's razor, you guys, for me. I always try to go back to Occam's razor, which, again, means the most likely situation or scenario is probably what happened. I think that if one of them had, like, fallen out of the cart or somehow got away, I think Occam's razor, again, th th that common sense, they would have been so badly wounded, so badly wounded, that I don't think that they would have been able to make it that far without help. 
even if they got help from a soldier, they would have needed medical assistance immediately. We're talking bodies. Again, these were not marksmen. So can you imagine how riddled these bodies would have been with the B word, B-U, I'm not going to spell the rest of it, but B-U-L, the thing that comes out of, you know, the other thing that starts with the, the G-U-Ns. I, again, I can't say these words on YouTube, but their bodies would have been so riddled with these injuries that in order to survive, I mean, just think about this common sense. In order to survive, they would have needed medical attention right away. I don't think that they would have been able to move themselves. I don't think that they would have been able to walk. I don't think they would have been able to get very far with this losing this much blood. Uh, of course, again, the trauma of everything that's happened. And, and again, if a soldier did take mercy on one of the family members, I don't know if that soldier would have found anybody to help him. And if the soldier had taken mercy on one of the family members, he would have also been putting his family and himself in harm's way. So I just don't, again, I, I think it's beautiful that people want to believe that, but I just don't think, I, I know people have their feelings around Prince Philip and the fact that this family, obviously the Romanovs too are part of the controllers and they can make things happen. They can make things appear as, as they are. They can make it appear that those are the bodies when maybe one of them isn't. I, I know where people's minds are going to go. But again, with this situation, I really believe that these are actually the Romanovs and what we have too many, too many of the, the journals of the guards, the testimony of the guards match. It just, it, it just, unfortunately it was horrific what happened to them. I'm not excusing that, but I don't think they survived. I absolutely do not think that they survived. Now, when it comes to, again, the conspiracies of, one of the children are multiple children actually surviving again i'm going to reiterate this for most people i do think it's it's hope it's hope in the human spirit but i do actually believe that this was probably either a russian disinformation campaign or a german conspiracy i do believe that the controllers the powers that be created this um confusion in order to misinform people, in order to derail people. And I do think that this is an important lesson for what's going on in our world today. You know, we have so many people that believe that a lot of these actors and perhaps late politicians are secretly alive, that they survived their, their passing. And I don't know if that's true or not. I have no idea. But my concern is, what does it matter to you? If you think that somebody survived a tragedy and you, you're, you believe they survived because you want to believe in the resilience of the human spirit, if that gives you some sort of inspiration for your own strength, then beautiful. But are you relying on these conspiracies of people still being alive because you think that they're going to come back and save you? Because if that's why you believe that these people are still alive, that for some reason that they're going to reappear and they're going to take down the controllers and they're going to save you, that in my opinion, you have fallen for a trick. You have fallen for, for brainwashing. You know, you have fallen for the black hats tricking you, giving you to give up your power look over here at these distractions while we destroy your life. The only person in this world who can save you is you. And that's your privilege. You are a fractal of God. You are a sovereign being. I know that in our world, we've been placed into a pecking order. We have the, the haves and the have nots. We have the elites and the non elites. I get that. Totally get that. That's that's we've been trained through religion, we've been trained through the matrix that us little people, us 99 percenters, us peasants, that we somehow don't have special powers, that we can't, we have to rely on the government to save us or somebody else to save us. And that, my friends, if you study the law of one, once again, I reference this a lot, 
That's part of the negative polarity. The negative polarity is worship of elitism, right? The positive polarity is a social memory complex where we're all sovereign individuals. We all have to save ourselves. So I would ask you to perhaps consider if you're one of these people who is sitting around waiting for John F. Kennedy Jr., Princess Diana, any of them, if you're waiting for them to come in and save you, why? Why? Why can't you save yourself? Because you can save yourself. And putting that responsibility, not only are you giving your power away by waiting for somebody else to come save you, but you're also putting the responsibility of your saving on somebody else's shoulders. And that's very selfish, right? So it's totally polarized negative. Now, if that's something that you're doing, I'm not saying you're a bad person at all. I'm saying we have to learn. I mean, there's been mistakes that I've made in this journey, and I will freely admit the mistakes that I've made. But we have to learn from those mistakes. And I hope that this Anastasia Romanoff story teaches us that, that we cannot rely on, that these conspiracies of famous politicians or of actors secretly being alive, that, that they, that this, is, this is nothing new. This has been going on for a very long time. And so are we just the idiots that are going to keep falling, falling for the same shtick? You know, are, 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 we that, are we that predictable? What would happen if we just thought, you know what? If John F. Kennedy Jr. is still alive, if Princess Diana is still alive, good for them. I hope that they are working through their trauma. I hope that they are healing themselves, and I hope they are working out relationships with their family members. That's good for them. But I need to focus on myself. I need to save myself. Just as they are saving their families, I need to save my family. So I hope that that gives us kind of a perspective. Now, another thing I want to I want to point out in conclusion is this idea of delusional disorders. And I'm not a therapist, but I do know that there are different categories of delusional disorders. We have many people in the truther community today who are under the same delusional disorders as Anna under Anderson was under. I believe that Anna Anderson truly believed that she was a Romanoff. I think that she was so mentally ill that she absolutely believed her own delusions. And I think she tricked a lot of people into believing her delusions. There is somebody, and I don't mind saying her name because I've actually had to file police reports. Her name is Kim Kukic. That's her legal name, but she goes by Kim Kukic Tesla. She is claiming that she is the lost niece, the secret niece of Nikola Tesla. She is not. She is not. I believe that she has her own delusional disorder. I know that she herself, a lot like Anna Anderson, has also been in mental institutions a lot. She is telling people on the world that she is Trump's secret press secretary. She isn't. All of her postings are very, very service to self, very negative polarity. She talks about her family as a Tesla being elite. Again, there's no such thing as elitism in the positive side in the light. Now, she's involved me a lot because she somehow thinks that I am, like, secretly working with her. And I'm not. And she's already done a lot to hurt me. She's already done a lot to try to get me unalive to myself. That's why police have had to be involved. That's why I've got a, the state's attorney has her case now for stalking and harassment. But I just want you guys to be aware of this. Use this, use this story of Anna Anderson and use my story of Kim Kukic, who claims to be Tesla, as, a, as something, learn from that. Learn from this, 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 these experiences so that you don't fall prey to the wickedness of the world. And I'll tag down in the description box below, I will tag past videos that I've done about my situation with Kim Kukic, who again, I personally, in my opinion, believe that she has the same psychosis, the same delusional disorder that this woman, Anna Anderson, also had. She's not trying 
to con people into believing she's a Tesla, she actually believes that she's a Tesla. She actually believes that Trump is telepathically talking to her in her head. She does not understand that the voices she's hearing in her head are a mental disorder. And she's hurt a lot of people. And I would assume, I'm going to speculate, that Anna Anderson also hurt a lot of people. And many of the other imposters probably hurt a lot of people. So again, as I've been saying throughout the duration of this whole Romanoff deep dive, especially with the Romanoffs, we see so many situations that are mirrored in our timeline today. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. We have got to take responsibility for our own lives. We've got to stop relying on somebody else to do it for us. If you allow somebody else to take care of you, you then allow that person to control you. If we allow for people to do stuff for us, then we are doing nothing more than welcoming a new cabal. We have to take our power back individually. And I'm here to tell you in conclusion that you can do that. Me, Bryce of Esoteric Atlanta, in my soul, in my heart, I know that you watching this right now, you are smart enough, you are brave enough, and you are kind enough to not need anybody else to take care of you. I believe in you as one human being to another human being. I want you to be free. I want you to be free. I don't want you to be controlled. I don't want you to be relying on the pocketbooks of other people who can pull the strings. I want you to be free. I want your children to be free. I want you to realize how unbelievably special each person watching this is. You don't need somebody else to save you. You are just as powerful as they are. Do not give your power away. You are a child of the Most High. So with that being said, that concludes our deep dive into the Romanoffs. Now, next Monday, we will not be doing any type of deep dive because I'm going to be doing a special episode with a whistleblower from the Mormon church. And then I'm going to be away for a week. And then we're going to go into some more fun topics. I know that we want to look at the Borgias. That's a fun one. We want to look at Cesare Borgia, who's the Jesus picture. Um, I know that Shanti over in Aquarius Rising Africa wants to look at Spartacus and the first documented slave uh, revolt. So there, we've got a, a lot of fun stories that are in the mix. Again, you guys, a big thank you to all of our sponsors, Spooky2, Gnostic TV, ASEA, all the sponsors, and our patrons, and our producers, everyone that keeps the lights on here in Atlanta, Georgia. I appreciate you guys all so much. Again, Spooky 2 is awesome. You get 5% discount if you purchase using my name, Bryce Watson, at checkout. All that information is down in the description box along with the Gnostic TV information where I have a two series. I have two series on Gnostic TV. I have the Esoteric Explorer series where I do way more deep dives, more scandalous deep dives that I can't do over on YouTube. So I put them on Gnostic. Um, and uh, they, I also have the Esoteric Health and Wellness series, which is all, you know, kind of how I ended this series, right? Like finding your power, being able to take care of yourself, being able to really truly root down into yourself so that you can take your full power back. So those two series are both on Gnostic TV. And then, of course, ASEA. We love our ASEA. All that stuff is down in the description box below, along with referenced videos. Please join us this morning, Eastern Standard Time at 10 a.m., over on Aquarius Rising Africa with Shanti. We're going to be discussing this live with a live audience with you guys. So if you want to contribute, if you want to your voice 
in this discussion over Anastasia Romanoff and his conspiracy, then please make sure to join us at 10 a.m. Eastern time. So whatever time that is for you so that you can participate in this live discussion. All right, you guys, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful week ahead. And I will talk to all of you very, very soon.